and as the next ship in line, they're all lined up like this, as the next ship in line sees that, he duplicates the flag and runs it up halfway. And then all the way back through the whole six. And when the, the signalman on the last ship gets that signal, then he call, does what's called, he two blocks the signal. That is, he runs it all the way up to the top and brings it down. And then each one in line does exactly the same thing. And when the squadron leader two blocks his signal, they execute. And, you know, if it means they all turn this way, they all turn. And if it means half of them turn this way and half of them turn that way and then come back this way, they, they all do that. Never a verbal command at all. They all know what that signal meant and they executed it when they're supposed to. And then they, they got back in line and called in a TBM or TBF uh, to tow a target. And they would come in on each ship and each ship would fire at the sleeve on the target. And they had, I think, five inch guns and, and 40 millimeters and 20 millimeters and 20, and when, when all of the flak happened behind this TBM uh, and that tow rope came out, there was nothing. I mean, the target was just obliterated and they were good. And boy, did that make a lot of noise. Uh, and the thing I never did learn to do, anything I have ever ridden, a bicycle or a motorcycle or a car, when you turn, it always tilts to the inside. But with the destroyer, when it turns, it tilts to the outside. And I, I didn't learn my sea legs in that day, but it was a very interesting break for us. I didn't mean to digress, but... Uh, when did you complete your 39th mission? must have been middle or late September and after we finished our mission they picked our crew to fly down to Australia to pick up fresh fruits and vegetables and fresh eggs down at Townsville which is uh, in Queensland province on kind of the, I guess it would be the northeast part of uh, Australia. And uh, we were down there for, you know, just a few days, uh, just enough to go to a dance or two and so forth and load up. And one thing about those fresh eggs, all we had furnished were powdered eggs but the guys in our mess hall had a formula where they would mix so many fresh eggs with so many powdered eggs and you'd swear and be damned that they were all fresh scrambled eggs. They were, they were really good. And then after we finished our missions and uh, had our orders to go home, uh, we had a lot of stuff that we would like to bring with us, you know. The navigator had a terrific master watch and uh, a, then the regular wristwatch. And uh, we had our 45s and a number of other things that we would have liked to uh, have brought home. And we said, well, can we take these? And they said, Sure, you can take them if you want to, but uh, if you get to the Philippines and they go through your baggage and you have them, you will have a delay in getting shipped home. And 
that was the magic words. We uh, we didn't take anything, and uh, we went up to uh, Clark Field, at Manila, and we were there waiting for a ship home. And I don't remember. We may have been there a week or ten days, not a real long time. Then we got on the ship and uh, headed home and it was the eeriest feeling in the world. Here we had flown over the water for all of these hours, but there's a certain detachment from the water. But when you're on a ship, you see nothing but water. And that's kind of disconcerting. And uh, the, the two things about the ship, I was uh, having dinner at the ward room one night and looked out a porthole on the other side of the room and I looked at the ocean. I ate my, was eating my dinner and I looked out the porthole and I saw a sky. I thought, no, wait a minute, that's not right. So I kept looking uh, at the, the uh, porthole, and I would see sky, and then I would see ocean, and then I would see sky, I would see, I thought, don't look out the porthole anymore. <laughs> and I looked down at my water glass, and the water glass is going like this. So I drank the water glass, finished my dinner, and went out on deck. Well, on deck, I was not really aware of the pool of the ship. It wasn't that violent, it was just... And the other thing about the trip home, I got a cup of coffee, and it was, it could melt your spoon almost. I never tasted such hot, strong coffee in my life. And I asked the mess sergeant, I said, that's the strongest coffee I ever tasted in my life. And he said, well, sir, how did you cut it? And I said, what do you mean cut it? Well, I had seen two urns there, and uh, I didn't realize that one of the urns was coffee and one was hot water. And the coffee that they made was about five times the normal strength of a cup of coffee. So depending upon how strong you wanted your coffee, you would put that amount in your cup and then fill it up with hot water, which made an awful lot of sense. And he said, we have so many people that we have to take care of that we have to kind of improvise so that everyone can have coffee. And I thought that was pretty clever. Yep. Was it on the way home that you heard about the atomic attacks no. and ultimately the Japanese surrender? No. Where we were had, you? We had not yet heard. We were about Okay, I'm going to guess and I don't really remember this at all. Uh, I'm going to guess that that trip was to take about a week. Now, I, I really don't remember the exact, but we had been at sea for roughly half the trip when we heard about the uh, atomic attack. And when we were about three quarters of the way home, we heard of the Japanese surrender. And it was the interesting thing in the world. We listened on the radio to all of the celebrations and all of the, the bells and the whistles and the comments and the cheers and everything on the radio at home. And on shipboard, 
you could have heard a pin drop. Nobody said anything. We just sat and just looked at each other. Uh, each guy thinking his own thoughts. You know, uh, some guys, you know, when we started home, uh, we didn't know what was going to happen to us. You know, if we go for another tour or what was going to be. So we were thinking about that and probably thinking why this couldn't have happened a year ago, you know, so that we wouldn't have been there and so forth. But nothing, absolutely nothing was uh, said. There were no cheers. There were no back slapping. Nothing. And then, uh, you know, I guess the next day we were kind of uh, relaxed and, and no longer absorbed with a wartime mindset and then we started talking about you know going home and doing this and that and the other thing and uh, when we got home the uh, the crew well, in the first place uh, we were supposed to go to Seattle, and we went to, instead to San Francisco. And the one thing I remember is going to the top of the mark, the four officers, and uh, when we walked in, the maitre d' said, Are you boys 21? And our pilot just looked, just pointed to the ribbons on his chest and said, these say we are, and he didn't even question us. He sat us down, and uh, to be honest and true, our crew, as people, were not ever very that close. We were a hell of a crew, but uh, you know we weren't from. We were from different parts of the country. Uh, we had different interests, we had different ambitions, we had different everything. And uh, our crew split up. And I have never heard from or tried to contact any one of the crew since. I know a lot of guys think that's very odd. Uh, you know, they have reunions and all of this that was just not in the cards for any of us. Maybe all the rest of them got together and it was just me. I don't know. Did you ever uh, realize your ambition of becoming a pilot? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you just wanted more time, but uh, I, I got to tell you this. Before we left, and I'll, I'll quit talking after I tell you this one story. How's that? Before we left, our squadron commander said, would any of you bombardiers or navigators like to go through pilot training? Well, since the pilots took turns sleeping, I thought that's the life for me. <laughs> so, so I said yes, and they put my name in the pool to go pilot training. Uh, I got home, went home and married the girl that I had planned to marry since I was 14 years old. And we went back, oddly enough, to Santa Ana. Uh, and I was enrolled in the pilot training program, went to primary flight training at Goodfellow Field in San Angelo, Texas, which I understand is still there. And we were flying a PT-17, which is a Stearman open cockpit biplane. And uh, so we went through our primary training, and I'm not going to go through all of that. But my instructor had six students, and we were the first students that he ever had in his life. Uh, so the rule was, when he thought that we were ready to solo, 
we had to take a ride with the chief instructor and he would decide if we're ready to solo. And uh, so, okay, came my turn and chief instructor came and he flew us out to what they called an auxiliary field, which is a field. It's just a section of land with what they called a stage house in the middle. And when there was a lot of flying going on, there was a fire truck there and, and snacks and everything as uh, the people flew in and flew out and all of this. So he landed and he, he put up what they called a T to show which way the traffic was. And he said, okay, Wiley, let's see what you got. So he cranked up, taxied out. And I knew that as soon as I pushed that throttle forward, that uh, there, the torque was going to take the airplane off to the side. And so I was going to be real smart. And I was going to put in the correction before I had the torque. Well, I put in the correction, but unfortunately, it was the way the torque was going to turn the airplane anyway and I veered off like this and headed right straight for that stage house. And I, I suddenly realized what was happening and I jerked on the stick and jumped up over the stage house, flew around the traffic pattern, rounded out maybe as high as this room, you know, about six, and or, seven, six or seven feet off the ground. And You'd be generous if you called it a controlled crash. We really whammed into the ground. And the instructor says, okay, try it again. Well, this time I realized what I had done. So I taxied out, I started down straight as an arrow, boy. And, uh, and I'm just like this, and the tail comes up, and uh, I'm just so proud of myself, and I suddenly realize that there's a fence at the, <laughs> at the end of the field. So I jerk on this, thing, but, and again, round, and again, rounded out about seven feet in the air. Wham! Into the ground. And he motioned the mill, taxi on in. And, and uh, I taxied in, figured, well, so ends the brief flying career of Bob Wiley. And we got in there, and uh, he threw off his shoulder harness, and I started to take mine off. And he got out on the wing, and he says, you go fly by yourself. You scared the hell out of me. I don't think he said hell, but <laughs> I thought, what? And uh, I figured, okay. So I went out, I taxied, took off, smooth as could be, flew a perfect track pattern, came out, made one of the prettiest three-point landings that you would ever want, just practically greased it onto the ground. And I thought, Yes! And I taxied back in, and he said, cut off the engine. So I cut it off, and I went to him and I said, Sir, I said, I have a question. I said, how could you possibly turn me loose to solo the way that I flew with you on those first two